Hi guys, back again. So those of you who are actually in my classes will have seen this week that I've set up now on Google Classroom. And so Google Classrooms is gonna be where I'm managing your work. So if you go there, there'll be messages on there. I'm gonna set you the tasks. There will be kind of uh, questions and all the stuff you actually need to do will all be on there. Send me a message if you can't get logged in, but it should be straightforward. All the instructions have been sent out um, last week. So these videos are gonna get a lot more simple now because rather than setting your tasks and telling you to pause the video and all that stuff, which is a bit awkward, you're just gonna have the content which I'll deliver in the video and I might still direct you to a few things on YouTube, a few kind of links and whatever. And then you're just gonna to need to respond to the stuff on Google Classroom. So the videos will get quicker and easier, your tasks will be on there and then you can submit them and I can mark them as well. So from now, uh, the second half of situational factors that's kind of how the videos will go and hopefully by next week we'll be on the dispositional factors that's kind of second half where I think it gets a little bit more interesting and relevant okay enjoy okay so I've fixed a scratchy mic problem that I had on the last video but my kids are all home and running around and bouncing off the walls so there's probably still going to be some other random noises so the third of the situational factors that you need to know about is culture. Culture describes the ideas, the customs and the normal social behavior of a particular people. Now, culture operates on lots of different levels. So there are cultural things which are common across groups of countries. And then there are cultural things which are different even within people living in the same town. We kind of have like a little microculture kind of, uh, kind of things. And there are lots of different ways to describe these different cultures and lots of different behaviors which culture affects. So you can probably think of a few off the top of your head. Culture also, um, often becomes kind of stereotyped. So when you think about British culture, people probably think about drinking tea, talking about the weather, um, that kind of stuff. It's just those typical British things. We think about American culture and we think of like sitcoms and Hollywood and fast food and being obese or whatever. And so um, culture can often become stereotyped um, and that's not necessarily accurate, but it usually is there for a reason. Uh, there usually are some, some very real differences there caused by different cultures in those different places. So some of the other phrases and things which, which link strongly into culture are the religion of a country. Um, religion provides a strong cultural foundation. So countries that share a religion will share um, other cultural traits. Um, then you have what are social norms. So just things which are kind of the unwritten but accepted normal behavior. So for example, um, on the continent in Europe, so in, like in France or in Italy, for example, it's fairly normal when you greet somebody to just give them a bit of a kiss, a bit kiss on the cheek. That's just like a normal social thing. Um, the, the further north you go in Europe, the less acceptable that is. So you go up to the UK, that's pretty weird, but some people might still do it. You go up into Scandinavia, and that's a, that's a big no-no. People up in Scandinavia have the biggest personal zones of any culture that they, they like more space around them, and they feel uncomfortable um, if people get, uh, get close to them sooner than people in other cultures. Culture also includes things that you would class as just like common knowledge. Now, because of the internet, a lot of the world share kind of similar uh, cultural things because we're exposed to similar things. So Hollywood, for example, the American film industry has a huge influence on international culture because those films are distributed all over the world. So even though some cultures might be very different to what you would see in America, they kind of still get American culture, at least as it's portrayed through films. Culture is really too big of a thing to talk about in terms of every way that it affects a person. It's a huge situational factor. So there are a couple of specific things that we look at. When we are talking about culture, 
In terms of the GCSE, we are most interested in how culture affects pro-social and anti-social behaviour. And so we look at aspects of culture which seem to have the biggest impact on that particular behaviour, to kind of narrow this down a little bit. The two types of cultures which, we, uh, which you need to know about are individualist and collectivist cultures. To start off with, I'm going to talk about individualist because that's what you're most familiar with because you are living in one. Individualist cultures are cultures which prioritise the self and the individual above others. Now, it doesn't mean that everyone's entirely selfish, but what it means is that you are responsible for yourself more than you are responsible for other people. That means that children are generally raised to be competitive, to try and be the best, to be successful. They're expected to work hard, they're expected to succeed because of that hard work, and you expect to be rewarded for your success. So if you work really hard, you expect to be able to uh, earn loads of money, for people to celebrate that and congratulate you, and for you to be able to um, to enjoy the benefits of that hard work. So you can buy a nice car, have a big house, go on holiday, whatever you want to do, because that's your success. Those cultures, uh, that, that is an individualist culture. The alternative to that is called a collectivist culture. Collectivist cultures prioritise um, society and particularly, uh, usually family or the people close by you in your community over yourself. And what that means is there'd be an expectation that you would maybe sacrifice some of your own personal desires in order to benefit or to help that uh, in your family or in, in your community around you. Children are raised to work as part of the family. Often in collectivist cultures, children will raise their siblings, they'll do a lot of housework and chores, and they don't get paid for those. It's just part of their life. Um, they're also expected to work and kind of support their family and community. And these cultures really, instead of celebrating personal achievement, celebrate something called altruism, which is a measure of how, kind of how kind somebody is. It's a measure of how much they how much their actions benefit other people without necessarily benefiting themselves linking that back then to antisocial and to prosocial behavior what we find is that collectivist cultures particularly in young people and in children display massively more prosocial behavior and it's pretty much in the definition so that's not really a surprise a survey that was done back in the 1970s showed, for example, that they did research in Kenya. And Kenya is a very collectivist, um, or has a very collectivist culture, or at least it did back then. And what they found is that in this uh, research that they did, 100% of Kenyan children showed this pro-social altruism. They, when they were given different scenarios, always acted to try and help the people around them over getting what they personally wanted. 100% of Kenyan children showed this, whereas only 8% of American children would act in a way that benefited somebody else more than themselves. So you can see there that just that difference in culture has a huge impact on the pro-social behavior, particularly of young people. Other countries with strong collectivist cultures, um, so. Kenya's one, um, the Philippines are one. Another example that's really useful to know about are um, kibbutz communities. Now, kibbutz communities exist pretty much only in Israel, and they are predominantly Jewish communities. Now, they're really fascinating to look at, and just to help you kind of get your head around what an ideal collectivist community looks like, um, I'm going to send you to a video that you can watch. It's not very long, but it does a great job at showing you what a collectivist culture looks like um, and, and how well it can work. So follow that to see there. All right. Now, I'm on the other hand, in, you've got individualist cultures. So individualist cultures are 
mainly what we would call your modern sort of Western culture. So the UK is definitely individualist, although slightly less so than the USA. Japan is also an individualist culture um, generally. However, the, it does have collectivist aspects when it comes particularly to caring for family and for older people. What I want you to think about is the kind of the, the pros and cons of these. You need to understand how it affects pro-social and anti-social behaviour. Have a watch of that kibbutz video, it's really interesting. Obviously you already know what an individualist culture is like. But just have a think. You know, would you be willing to, to share everything that you earned equally with everybody else if it meant that you didn't ever have to worry so you, you know you always get taken care of but what it essentially means is that you know if you're a top businessman working 70 hours a week and you've trained really hard to get there and you're earning like i don't know half a million pounds a year it means that you end up with the same amount of money as an untrained farm laborer for example all the money you bring in goes into the same pot as that farmer and then you both get the same amount out at the end what you tend to find is that people raised in individualist cultures are, are quite deeply uncomfortable with that idea. It just doesn't seem right or fair. So we talk about collectivist cultures as causing or increasing levels of pro-social behaviour. But what increases levels of anti-social behaviour? That's a separate kind of concept. So when we look at culture, there are these two sides that we look at. We look at how collectivist cultures have more pro-social behavior than individualist we also need to look at what causes more anti-social behavior and which uh, which kind of cultures create that now again there are lots of variables involved but by far the strongest single factor of predicting anti-social behavior is economic inequality now what i mean by that is the biggest factor in terms of how antisocial people become is how unfair they view their society as being. Now the reason for this is actually quite deep and I touch on it in a couple of different topics but you don't at this point need to know exactly the reason why you just kind of need to know that that's how it is. Now one way that we measure inequality is um, there's something called a Gini index. Now, this is basically a mathematical way of of representing inequality. So what they do is they take the income of every person in a country and they basically compare it. And what they're looking at is how badly spread out is that is that wealth. So for example, if everybody in the country earns exactly the same amount of money then their Gini index would be zero there's zero difference um, it's so the lower the number the more equal uh, the outcomes or the more equal the the money that that people have if you have say a thousand people and 999 of them get nothing and one person has all the money well, that would be awful. That is the worst case scenario for this inequality. And you'd have nearly a thousand people, you have 999 really grumpy people, very angry at this one person who has everything. And you can kind of understand why. And so it makes sense that inequality causes antisocial behavior. There is inequality everywhere. The main place that it becomes a big issue is when those people who are on the lower ends of the income, when they don't even have enough to meet their basic requirements. So in the UK, for example, you know, I'm very aware that there are premiership footballers earning tens of millions of pounds. And that, in my opinion, is unfair. However, I'm not going to go and Molotov cocktail someone's house because they're earning more than me, because actually I've got enough. So although, yes, it seems unfair that they can afford, you know, whatever, um, at least, well, I can feed my family and I've got a car and I've got a house. I've got all the things that I need. But when you're in a country where you can't even feed your family, 
and yet you can still see these premiership footballers or drug lords or politicians or whoever driving around in their massively expensive cars, well, that's when people start getting cross. And that's when why uh, large-scale antisocial behaviour starts occurring. If you're interested in knowing where we fit and how this looks, um, I'll, there's a map here. So this is a, the Gini score, which is um, provided, I think, by the World Bank or something. So you can kind of have a look and compare countries to each other. And, and what you'll see is that actually the UK is not too bad. Our wealth is quite well distributed. So just to kind of wrap up then, culture affects pro-social and antisocial behaviour. Collectivist cultures increase levels of pro-social behaviour. They make people behave in a way which is better to society. Individualist cultures don't encourage that pro-social behaviour. Individualist cultures tend to be more economically successful. And so you kind of have to, I guess, just decide what matters most to you. Antisocial behaviour is mainly caused by inequality, particularly when that inequality is combined with um, a poor standard of living for most of the people involved. And that is the main way that culture affects pro and antisocial behaviour. Thank you.